This is the first lecture for Monday, April 27th, the last day of class. And for this, we're continuing on this topic of human interactions. There are a lot of humans in the world, and there's no getting around the fact that we have a huge influence on many other living things and the ecosystems around the world in general, both on land and in the water, very widespread effects. So in this lecture, the two lectures, well, this lecture for Monday split up into two parts, hopefully won't take more than 50 minutes. There's, there's a considerable amount of information to cover and I'd like to get through this, but uh, we should be able to do this in less than 50 minutes. So the other day, we were looking at the value of biodiversity to recognize that different people have different ideas of why biodiversity is important, why maintaining biodiversity is of value, how to go about accomplishing that. And then we're focusing specifically on extinction, why things go extinct. We looked at the scale of extinction and saw that it's at unprecedented levels. Historically, there was about one extinction per year these days, there's about one extinction per day. That's a lot more, one per day than one per year. And so we're looking at some of the different factors that are responsible. And we looked at these four main factors that lead to species going extinct. So let's look at these in terms of Habitat reduction and fragmentation. Now, that is the one that's the most common these days. There's also some that are specific to certain species, especially if they have small populations they are more prone to going extinct. If there's endemic populations, which means that they're, they're found only in a certain place, also more prone to going extinct. Then the introduction of exotic species has had a huge influence on other things, and it's related to the way that move, that humans move around. It's a global world these days. There's all kinds of things that are introduced. And then this historical problem of things going extinct that led to a lot of extinctions historically, not as many lately, was over-exploitation. So in terms of habitat reduction and fragmentation, now, some of this is going to apply to landscape ecology that we looked at earlier in the semester. First of all, if you reduce the amount of habitat that there is for a, a population, for a species, then obviously you've got less support for, for that population. You've got less room for fewer individuals. It's going to affect the population in a negative way. You're going to be able to support fewer individuals with carrying capacity of different environments is going to decline. That's one thing. It's just very straightforward that there's less habitat to go around to support fewer individuals. But fragmentation is also a big part of this. It's not just that there's less habitat, but this less habitat has a lot more edges. These edges are inferior quality habitat. And so that also contributes to the inability of reduced size of habitat to be able to support individuals. There's fewer individuals that can be supported. And another thing about these edges is that, that uh, individuals, or the fragmentation of habitat anyway, you don't have one big habitat, you've got a bunch of little ones, is that the ability to migrate between habitats has a big influence on population sizes. Now, some animals can move pretty easily from one small bit of habitat to another, but there's barriers to that movement. Now, we see a lot of animals get run over by cars when they're moved. They're trying to cross roads, and there's a, the impediments to being able to move between habitats. So let's look at a few examples of this. Look, here's uh, this area out in the Pacific Northwest where there was originally this dense forest 
spanned thousands and thousands of acres. And the practice for logging is to go and clear cut. So they, they make a road that goes into some place as a logging road. They bring in their equipment and they cut down every last tree that there is. Now people would argue, oh, well, you're, you're preserving a lot of habitat. You're not going through and thinning out these big giant swaths of the forest. You're, you're just concentrating your efforts here. Well, it's very destructive. It completely destroys the ecosystem and it creates a bunch of fragmented habitat and it creates a bunch of edges. So not only if you look at this picture, obviously there's less forest than there was originally because there's all these clear cut areas. But not only that, the edges of the, the habitat that remains, it's drier, it's windier. It's easily, more easily invaded. There's more parasites that come in there and the animals that are along the edges more vulnerable to predators. So it's not just to reduce size of habitat, it's to reduce quality as well. Here's an example down in Brazil. If you go back, if this wasn't even that long ago, it's in the lifetime certainly of your grandparents. 1946, if you look at this one little region of Brazil and you look at the extent of forestation in 1946, most of the, this region was forested. Just 13 years later, 1959, a huge amount of destruction of the forest. And what's left is this forest along the, the coastline. 1974, 1988, you see there's tiny little bits of forest that remain in 1988. Now, if you could find the, a similar map for 2020 or even 2018, years later, there's it could be that there's hardly any forest at all. So if you're a forest animal or plant, if you rely on that kind of habitat, you can imagine how hard it is to live there in 1988 versus 1946, how hard it is to move around there if you need a certain amount of of land to support yourself and and there's all these edges as well so it's not just a reduction in the size of the habitat but it's a huge reduction in the quality of the habitat as well and if you look at the this figure here in terms of the years after fragmentation it's just a short period of time before you start to suffer this, these pretty extensive decreases in biomass. There's a lot of different ways by which humans are responsible for destroying habitat, fragmenting habitat. There's agriculture, there's development, cities, housing developments, there's uh, mining and things like that. There's, if you're talking about aquatic systems, there's dredging. There's making dams, there's filling in land. If you live around Boston, you know the original Boston was a tiny little fraction of what it is now with all the, the landfill that's been put in the bay. So there's a number of different ways that landscapes can be altered, that habitat can not only be destroyed or reduced in size, but it can be fragmented. And all of those have problems associated with them. Here's uh, some other examples of deforestation. You can have clear cutting. You can have you can have uh, fires. Different ways that trees are cut down for different reasons. Whether you're using the trees themselves or whether you're clearing the land for livestock. If you go around the world in South America and Asia, especially. Some places, there's a huge amount of deforestation that's taken place. It's taking place at an alarming rate. A lot of deforestation continuing every day. And so there's a lot of habitat destruction. People are worried about this in terms of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide. The, 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 you're destroying all this vegetation that can sequester carbon. It can take carbon into it and produce oxygen and you're destroying these, but that's just in terms of these gases. If you're talking about animals and plants, it's a huge amount of destruction. And so 
if you look in Africa, Asia, South America, like I said, there's a lot of deforestation that's taking place for different, different reasons. And even in North America, now we have a lot of forests in North America. Some of them aren't the original forests, but they're the, in New England, there's a lot of forests around New England states and New York as well, New Jersey. And you can see the percentage of birds and, and mammal species that rely on forests. There's a lot that are in grasslands and other habitats, but forests are an important ecosystem for the existence of a lot of different species. It's not just forests, though. It's not just cutting down forests, but there's we need to feed people, we need to grow things, and so there's a huge amount of ecosystem modification, habitat destruction, where some natural ecosystem, natural habitat, is, has been converted to agriculture. Now, for some species, they can tolerate this. They can live in the, the agricultural areas as well as they can other places. But there is a lot of land on Earth that's used for agriculture. 12%, that's quite a bit of all the land that's out there. 20% rangeland where you have things like cattle, sheep, grazing. And so it's not just a habitat destruction, but there's also problems with erosion and flooding and, and the, the nutrient cycling in the soil that we looked at earlier. Another thing is the draining of wetlands. And if you look at some states like Iowa, California, they, there used to be all these wetlands all over that were important for amphibians and important for birds and, and different organisms. There's a lot of habitat that's been destroyed by draining wetlands. And now, if you do something to a wetland, you're supposed to, well, it's, they're protected, first of all, but you're supposed to replace this. So there's some development sometimes when they destroy wetlands. But they're supposed to uh, have uh, some kind of mitigation effort where sometimes they fix up another place and, and make it the same size. They replace the wetlands that's being destroyed by, by making repairs some other place. But still, there's a huge amount of, of uh, wetland destruction. And so if you look at these maps, you see there's some places where there's been a lot of of wetlands, a lot of aquatic ecosystems that have been filled in historically versus what they're like now. Huge parts of San Francisco is big, Boston, like I said, New York, places like that where there's a lot of habitat destruction in terms of filling in wetlands. Urbanization, obviously one, there's a lot of people. There's been this big move over the last hundred years or so from people in rural areas into cities. A lot of people live in a dense area. We're seeing some of the effects of that right now. But this is, it's just, it's habitat that's completely unsuitable for most organisms. Maybe, there's some things maybe that can do well, rats and flies and coyotes, some places. But we need some place to live. There's a huge amount of habitat destruction habitat fragmentation when a city expands out gets bigger and bigger when there's housing developments that fragment habitat so those are some of the main ways that habitat is not only reduced but fragmented and and those problems combined create a huge problem for a lot of organisms out there they're just trying to find some place to live, trying to find some energy, find some food, and destroying their habitat will do them in much worse than actually finding them, killing them, as we used to do with this problem of over-exploitation. Another problem that exacerbates this, the rate of extinction, there are certain species that go extinct, they're a lot more prone to extinction, vulnerable to threats that uh, dwindle their numbers down, and that's small population sizes. We looked at this when we looked at population ecology, which we spent a considerable time in this 
in this class earlier in the semester. So the smaller a population is, it makes sense that the, the fewer individuals there are, there also tend to be a more limited distribution, then the greater risk there is for a species to go extinct. There's some species with huge populations, with millions and millions and millions of individuals spread out all over the place, but there's a lot of species that the population isn't that big, their distribution isn't that wide, and so they're very prone to extinction, especially if you have, uh, affect some of the individuals by habitat destruction, you, ex you affect some of the individuals by introduction of, of exotic species or invasive species that compete with them or eat them or prey upon them. And also, if you, if you have other effects on their population, such as eating them or killing them for their feathers or whatever you're using them for. So you can imagine the difference between some small population with a limited distribution and how that population has a good chance of going extinct a lot of times versus one that's a, a there's a lot more individuals in the population, a lot wider spread uh, distribution, a couple of different subpopulations, different continents, wide, wider spread and less prone to being affected. So here's this diagram that shows some of the things that, some of the factors that go into extinction. And here are the one at the top, there's habitat loss, but there's the small population size. Small population size has a, a big influence on the vulnerability of different species to go extinct. It certainly explains why there's this group of species that has gone extinct. A lot of those had initial small population sizes as well as this limited distribution, limited range. Endemic species that were only found one place in the world, that population was went extinct and there's no other populations anywhere else in the world. There was just that one and it's gone. They're extinct. So if you look at some of the you know, there's a lot of interest in different species, uh, especially charismatic ones that people love, like a panda bear and elephants and dolphins and things like that, tigers and, and apes. So there's a lot of interest in different species, but there's a lot more obscure ones. You know, there's snails and there's insects and there's worms and there's plants that people don't know about or they don't care about, but there's all these different species. Here's, if you look in this figure, there's all these different charismatic ones that people would look at a lot of these and say, oh, we need to save the tiger. We need to save the elephants and gorillas and dolphins, of course. But there's a lot of species that uh, don't receive the same amount of attention. They don't have as much sympathy from people. So there's a lot of endangered species. These are all endangered species. And if you looked very closely at these, you'd see these maps and you'd see the different estimates of the, the population size and their, their distribution. And a lot of these small populations and uh, limited distribution, vulnerable to extinction. The last thing I want to talk about today is the effect that exotic species have on driving things to extinction, really speeding up the rate at which different species go extinct. Now there's different terms for this. There's alien species and there's uh, invasive species and there's exotic species. And for some people, they all have their own, they're, they're different and they have different, different uh, definitions in order to meet being called a, an exotic species versus an alien species. But they're basically introduced. These are species that didn't normally occur, didn't naturally occur in the, some ecosystem. And they're introduced there by humans. There are a huge number of species that have been introduced. A huge number on land, there's plants, there's animals. And the problem is that when these species come in in this very unnatural way, 
It's not through evolution. It's not being acted upon by natural selection. So it's a process that takes place in a very short period of time in this unnatural way. So some of the problems is that, that there can be a huge amount of predation on some native species. There can be a huge amount of competition. There can be uh, disease that spread. All these different factors can have a huge influence on populations, especially if you're talking about small populations or very specialized species. And so you've got some speed. They don't know what to do. They've never encountered this. They're, they're trying to respond to this invasive species on a time scale of evolution, which is how they would normally respond to, to changes in their environment. But they can't keep up with those changes. They can't compete or they're eaten or whatever reason d disease is spread. But their population dwindles much, much faster than they even have a chance of responding from an evolution point of view, from an adaptation point of view. And they go extinct. So there's different places around the world, sometimes very little land area where there's a huge number of extinctions. And a lot of these due to invasive species. Hawaii is one. A lot of islands where there's a whole bunch of different species and they're really affected in a negative way in terms of invasive species or exotic species. So humans, we get around. In the old days, it was by boats. And then things would come off the boats. Rats or things that we introduced either on purpose or accidentally, pigs and goats and things like that, that would would uh, have big influence on the native vegetation. They never had to deal with those, so they're completely unequipped. Different uh, ways of uh, different plants that we would introduce, some ornamental plants. Now, these days, there's a lot of pets that people have. You have a a Burmese python, for instance. Oh, I don't like, I'm going to let it go, let it go. Gets out into the Everglades, and there's a huge population of snakes out in the Everglades that's completely changed that ecosystem in terms of mammals. They eat everything. So there's hardly any mammals there. There's all these different birds are being impacted. And so if you just look at the United States, 4,500 plus invasive species and a, a good proportion of those 15 percent you might not think that's that many but there's a that's quite a bit of problems that are caused by these invasive species and if you're talking about vertebrates which are most, some of the most obvious and and documentable 142 at least that many species but there's a whole bunch of weeds plants all kinds of different things that get a hold on some ecosystem and they're really, really hard to get away from. And as I said, the native plants or animals that are affected can't compete or they get eaten or the disease is spread. And sometimes it doesn't take very much. Now, if you look at the number of invasive species or exotic species internationally, it's a, a big problem. And some of these introductions have been on purpose. Some of them have been accidental. So if we look at the number of endangered species or threatened species that are affected in a negative way, that's what this histogram shows. The number of species that, uh, the number of endangered and threatened species is shown there of plants, terrestrial vertebrates, fish, insects and mollusks and crustaceans so there's a lot of different species that are affected in a negative way that are they're endangered or they're threatened so the populations are in peril and then the number of those species that are caused that are affected in a negative way by exotic species or invasive species so you can see that there's still a lot of them that aren't affected so negatively but still if you're looking at these different populations that are trying to hang on and not go extinct, that we're trying to manage in a way that they won't go extinct. That's a lot of them that are affected in the, the yellow bars there. 
And if you look at all these different states, all the different number of invasive species, I mean, look at some of these. California and Florida have huge numbers. Hawaii, the tiny little Hawaii, has got a lot of invasive species. And if you could see tiny little Rhode Island, which is always hard to see on maps, we've got hundreds of invasive species that have negative impacts. Even Massachusetts, New York, these areas that are close to us, a lot of invasive species. And then one example, there's a couple of different examples with snakes, the pythons that I mentioned in the Everglades have completely changed the Everglades in terms of an ecosystem. But the brown tree snake that's been introduced in different islands in the Pacific, in Guam, for instance, it's also a problem. They're really keeping an eye out for these brown tree snakes in Hawaii as well. They get there, they fall out of the tire wells of planes or the people's luggage, things like that. And the reason why they're so worried about these getting into different islands is because the, these there's all these birds. There's a lot of ground nesting birds, even birds that nest in trees that have just been decimated by the brown tree snake. They climb up in trees. And so in Guam, for instance, they've led to the extinction of 18 different species of birds, five lizards. They just go around and eat everything. They don't have natural predators. These birds and lizards aren't, are, they evolved in a situation for millions of years where they didn't have any big snake predators. There weren't any snakes that occurred there naturally. So this is an example of a, you get this one species in there, nothing controlling it. Population does very well and it has a huge impact on all the different species there, or at least a lot of different species. So uh, this for the second lecture and the last lecture for the class, we can look at overexploitation as a mechanism that's led to extinctions. Now you might think this isn't happening that much, but there's there's still a lot of history with overexploitation. So we'll look at that on in the second lecture.